How can you test it? What, what is tessellation? Does anyone here actually know what tessellation is? I, I need nods, yeses. If you don't know what tessellation is, then we're in big trouble. Okay, the same shape repeated over and over again. Infinitely. <laughs> Do you want to try again? Think, okay, so tessellation is, start recording. Do scene, okay. Tessellation is the process of taking a shape and stacking, if that shape can stack next to itself in a system where there is no space in between, then that is tessellated. So what shapes can you tessellate? You can tessellate squares. You can tessellate hexagons, so squares and rectangles. Hexagons. Easiest way to draw a hexagon is to draw a cube in 3D. Hexagons. Now, when it comes to hexagons, is that the actual simplest form of tessellation for that shape? Huh? Triangles, right? So with hexagonal uh, tessellation, you're either looking at equilateral or ice, uh, bleh, bleh. equilateral or yeah. The word has left my brain. Isometric's not the right word, is it? Isosceles. Isosceles. You can either have an isosceles or uh, equilateral triangle, and. Uh, can you break squares and rectangles down into triangles? But what are they? They're right angle triangles, okay? So there are multiple ways of tessellating things um, and we can do that on surfaces. So more inputs, let's go to HDMI. Go, yes. Okay, so, so um, what Lunchbox does is it takes a surface um, and we could use this uh, screen as a surface and it divides that up into particular forms. Like there are, there are two sets of comp uh, lists of components, one which gives you lines and the other which gives you surfaces. I don't want to really teach you guys how to use Lunchbox today because it is so simple that all you have need is a surface and uh, you plug that surface into Lunchbox and Lunchbox will do the job for you. Now the reason I hate it so much is it's so easy and it, you are more likely to panelize your surfaces with Lunchbox it means you don't actually learn how to panelize surfaces uh, yourself. And the key reason that's annoying is that we rarely have to panelize surfaces in a simple way. Um, so for example, uh, the various different roofs that I have made in the past that have had diagrids, so that meaning a triangular tessellation. Um, it's very rare for me to just say, I'm gonna divide this surface evenly and have that work. I need to be able to control the exact coordinates of some of the points in that system. And if you were to just take a line and divide that evenly, that might not, that might line up there but I need it to line up here, and it doesn't, right? Now, Lunchbox doesn't give you that control. Lunchbox only gives you the control to divide evenly, okay? I'm gonna show you a super secret script for a super secret job that I can't tell you where this job is. All you, all you can know about it is that it's a stadium, 
but it's the exact reason why I don't use lunchbox. So this, in no way is this a um, stadium that uh, will be built. It is purely uh, some work that needed to be done recently <clears throat> just to get an image. But the key thing here is, uh, I, I guess you kind of need to understand how stadiums work, but uh, like everyone here kind of enjoys sport at least a little bit, at least a little bit. Like the Europeans here like soccer or football. No, they don't. You're not European? Oh yeah? You're born, raised? You prefer rugby? Cricket? No. Go on. <laughs> Martial arts, okay. Hello. Um, okay, let's let's just stay in the um, let's stay in the large arena style stadium. Um, although this still applies. Uh, most large stadiums will have a low lower bowl. They'll have a, a middle bowl, which is where all the corporate people sit. It's where all the suites are, and then there are, there's a large upper bowl on, on the top, right? And there is a, there's a physical process in, involved in actually having to hold up that upper bowl, okay? And so you usually do that using these things called rakers. They're these large concrete or steel uh, beams that sit on an angle that hold the, those stairs that peop where people sit, okay? Now, those are usually the thing that holds up the roof, okay? So, unless you've got one of those sort of lozenge-shaped stadiums, you're gonna actually have, have to use the, the rakers. Uh, I'll get you an image as an example. So you can see here, I know it's a bit cut off. Okay, maybe not. Thanks, Image Shack. You can see, see that this element there, that's the raker, that's the thing that's holding up the, the, the platforms for the seats, but then it immediately turns into a beam that is the roof, okay? So, in this particular design, someone, now I couldn't get the whole stadium, it was like 100 megabytes and um, it's super secret, so all you get is lines. But if we imagine these red, the red lines that you see here as <clears throat> the rakers, those are things that have been set out by someone who's actually designed the stadium and then someone's come along to me and said, I want a roof. I want it to be like a saddle bowl start uh, saddle curve type surface <clears throat> and let's see if it actually opens and uh, we want the these rakers to end up starting a diagrid and so you can make out you can see that diagrid working on that surface okay cool this, is, this might actually be one of the first scripts that you've seen that is actually like producing architectural space or outcomes. Is that, is that the case? You've, okay. It's not a complex script in my, from my opinion, but that, so that's the script. Okay, that's doing two roofs and I've stopped at one roof and I've changed because thing, things have changed. But the, the key thing is, if I were to take this particular roof surface, and I believe it is there, and I was to divide that using lunchbox, uh, the, this lecture is about how I don't like lunchbox. For quick tests, it's useful, but that's about it. 
Um, so if I were to use lunchbox for this, and is it, uh, okay, I got it. I can really only control the divisions. How do I control the fact that those divisions line up with my rakers? It's almost impossible because the rakers aren't actually, they don't sit evenly on, on the, the surface, okay? So even if I manage to line one of them up, like this one, it, the, they're not, the rest aren't gonna line up. The second thing is some surfaces are not drawn in a way where you, if you were to divide them, the, the divisions will be equal. So for example, if I were to loft these lines together, and I look at that topographically, so we go from, not to, topologically, we go from zero to one, which might, let's say that has a unit of five, and then from one to two, that has a unit of one. If we were to start dividing that, uh, let's say we just draw a, a division line across, it would end up bending, refracting, as if it was traveling through uh, denser space, because we're going from a uh, one to a two in the topology in a shorter distance. Does that make sense? Yeah? So if I were to, it would, it would produce a line like that. Okay, and that's half the reason why uh, when we look at this diagrid that Lunchbox has made, we get an environment like this as it tightens up around that corner because the spacing of the loft gets tighter as it goes around. Yeah? Okay. So, this, I, I, I keep referring back to last semester. This is something that my class did talk about last semester, and it's something that I need you guys to understand, and that is uh, relative space, okay? Did we, have we gone over it? So, for example, did I, have I explained U and V to anyone in this, in this lecture? No? Okay. Okay, that's perfect. So, for us to start dealing with surfaces, we need to think about them as four-sided objects, okay? And with a f if I were to draw, draw the simplest four-sided object ever, a square, let's try another one. Ah, yes, a square, and I was to start talking about coordinates, what comes to mind when I mention coordinates? X, Y, Z? Right, okay, so in a square, where would I put X? And where would I put Y? And where would I put Z? Out. Right, so just Z. Right, okay. So we, everyone understands the simple X, Y, Z Cartesian coordinates, okay? But when we start talking about things that are relative to an object, we rarely use X, Y, Z as those labels because X, Y, Z is specifically in Grasshopper used for the world coordinate, okay? So the zero coordinate in the model and anything relative to that is uh, X, Y, Z. When we start talking about a square and the relative coordinates on that, we use the term U, V, and W, okay? Has anyone played with video games or like tried modding video games? You'll start to see things like UV, and it's, it's not the infrared or ultraviolet light, it's referring to the U and the V coordinate of, of an object. So in Grasshopper, we can either talk about U and V coordinates as dimensions, so like let's say that's 10 centimeters, so that's a U of 10 
and a V of zero. Or we can talk about them as percentage, percentages. So what coordinate would that be in UV? In percentage. It's 100% along the V line and it's 0% along the, sorry, the U line and it's 0% along the V line. Okay, so we can talk about that as z uh, 1 comma 0. Okay, so how many, how many sides does every surface have in Grasshopper? Four? Are you, that's a tentative four, not Eden. This four, tentative? You th could there be surfaces with more or less than four sides? Can you think of them? Yeah, so name one. A surface with five edges. So that's, that's a five-sided surface, you reckon? So grasshopper and rhino, there is no such thing as a five-sided surface. There's no such thing as a three-sided surface. There's only ever four-sided surfaces. And when you see a five-sided surface, what you're likely to be seeing is a four-sided surface that's been trimmed, okay? So even though something's been trimmed, there's this inherent uh, surface behind it that is uh, four-sided. So for example, I'll just, I'll draw one for you. That's a surface. It's got multiple sides and one of the sides isn't straight. But if <clears throat> I quickly pull that into Grasshopper and we untrim it, we can see that it's actually a four-sided surface. Okay? If someone has drawn a three-sided surface, it could be a four-sided surface like so, or they've actually drawn a four-sided surface, but one of the sides is zero in length, okay? So, with that being said, every surface has a U and a V coordinate uh, system. That means even if it's five-sided, there's still a U and there's still a V, yeah? So if we just think in relation to things, We've got a surface, which is this table, stay, right? It's four-sided. It's got a U and a V coordinate, and I'm going to put a point here. What, how would I describe that point In, as a coordinate? Just have a guess. It, you don't have to be specific. I wasn't. What is that? In percentages, in percentages. So it's about there. Right. So that coordinate works. We can, we can identify that coordinate on this. Therefore, if I were to draw a nice little square on your forehead, right, I could work out the exact coordinates on your forehead. Right? Or, for example, if we were to just consider this as a cylinder with a seam down the side, then that's zero and that's one, zero, one. So we can actually work out where that point sits on that surface in, in that relative space. So if we, we said, 60, so it's about there, I'd say it's about there, right? So we have two apples, we're comparing apples with apples, a surface, a four-sided surface, and a four-sided surface, then I can draw anything on this surface and have it appear on this surface. Does that make sense? Okay, so we do this all the time. Um, 
Actually, let me, let me take a step back. We really like this space, okay? This space is really, really sensible for us because it's 2D, yeah? It's flat, we understand it. It's, it's, only, it's only got two numbers. You, you can move around anywhere in this space. You're only dealing with two numbers. This is really complex, right? Think about it. The, the label that was printed on Mount Franklin, it was printed in 2D. It wasn't printed on the 3D surface. It's simple. And they wrap it over the, the cylinder, okay? So can anyone think of a process that we use every day, almost every, well, hopefully you use it a lot, where you are dealing with complex 3D space, but you only deal with it in 2D. Complex 3D space, but you only look at it in 2D. Pardon? Pardon? Yes, so, can, so Google Maps. That's, so maps are 2D, right? But they represent a sphere. Yes? So the latitude and longitude of a sphere is just like saying the percentages of, of, a, of a map and what Google Maps has done, or what, in this case, the guy's name's Web Mercator, uh, the Web Mercator system. You guys will find out where I live, probably. Oh, no. So, It's not gonna let me look, uh, zoom out anymore. That's flat, but it's representing a, a 2D system, okay? A 3D system. Um, we do have actually some Europeans here. Have you, have you guys ever visited uh, Iceland? No, Iceland's tiny, but it's really big here, right? Why is that? Pardon? Scale, huh? Scale, but what, what do you mean? Right. So how tall, how wide is the, if, if we were to take the sphere of Earth and we were to look at the V coordinates of it, what, what dimension does the V coordinate have at the top? Like what's its actual length? Sorry, V, sorry, U. What's its length? What is the actual length of the U of the surface? Like it's actual millimeter, in millimeters, how long is it? Huh? Zero, right? Of course, if I'm gonna ask you a question and be that specific, it can only be one thing, right? Zero, it's not like you're gonna be like 10.53 millimeters, right? It's zero millimeters, yeah? And the bottom is how much? Zero. So that means as you get closer and closer and closer to the North and South Pole, the dimensions are gonna get wider and wider and wider. Yeah? Okay. So, how does this relate to doing stuff with Lunchbox? I think this might have to roll over into the tutorial, most likely. Yeah, okay, so the thing, the thing is if, like, what Lunchbox does is it just has an algorithm that knows where to put points. So it just takes the, the, uh, the surface, it says, okay, divide this dimension by, this length by x, and divide v by y, and then connect them up, right? So uh, we get back to um, my script. I think maybe we'll start, do you want to start from scratch? Yeah, we'll start from scratch. So, if I have a surface that, is complicated, It's complicated enough. Yep, it's hyperboloid. And 
I want to start mapping things to that surface, then all I need is a 2D space. I'm going to put the table back. You don't need this example anymore, right? And I need to uh, create, I want, like I want to draw something on that, but I don't want to draw in 3D. Then we just need that surface to be uh, evaluated based on its coordinates. So I'm not even going to bother, oh, we're still in my um, stadium. It didn't copy it, okay. Whatever. Huh? Okay, cool. <clears throat> okay, so we've got our surface. Now I'm, I'm gonna just quickly get a rough dimension of that. So do you, do you see this component? It's actually, uh, we need bifocals as a, so this, this component here gives us rough dimensions of a surface. But <clears throat> you can see here the, the, the U, it's giving us like 30 meters, or, or, um, and the V, it's giving us 37. If I actually squeeze this up to the point where it's almost nothing, do you see how it's not, like which side do you measure, right? Do you measure the left or the right? So a lot, like this component, even though it might give you approximate dimensions of, of the surface's edge, it's not actually giving you the, the, those lengths. It might, it might be giving you the average or, or the maximum, but it's, it's not doing that. Either way, I'm gonna use this these two dimensions to create a surface that we're going to work on. And that surface is going to take the U as an X dimension and the V as a Y. And I'm going to just stretch this out a bit more just to make it less of a square. Cool. So this is going to be our 2D space. And if I draw anything on this surface, As long as I can somehow translate that from one surface to the other, uh, I can redraw it. So what, just, um, this is a very leading question. What is the basis of all geometry? If you break all geometry down, you're left with points, right? And points are made up of what? Point. Yes. So. If I were to grab this curve and break it down into points, and we're going to be rough here, right? We don't have to be super specific. So I'm going to break it down to 10 points. All I have to do is find where those points exist on my 2D surface in UV. So the component that helps us do that is a, a surface closest point. So with that, you give it a point and a surface. And as long as the surface that goes into it is parametricized, sorry, re-parametricized, re which does what? Except for James. What does re-parametricizing do? Re Sophie? You don't know? OK. How, how big, is, roughly, how big is this table? It, what would the U and the V dimension be? Just rough. Okay. What reparametricizing does, tongue twister, is it takes the dimension of 50 and it turns it from 0 to 1. And it takes the dimension of 2 or 2000 or 20, whatever, uh, and it converts it to 0 to 1. So remember how I was getting Chris to do things as percentages? It does that, right? So if you don't want to work in percentages, don't re-parametricize. Re but if you do, and most likely you do, we want it re-parametricized. So 
the, the UV coordinates that we get as an output are always going to be between 0 and 1. Okay? We'll never get anything above it. 1 being 100% and 0 being 0%. So that's giving us the coordinates of the points. We've got our base surface, our 3D surface, sorry. All we have to do to find those points on that surface is use the evaluate surface component. That receives a UV coordinate that will re return a point, a normal, and a frame or plane. So our 3D surface goes into that. Our UV coordinates go in. And we need to make sure that that is also reparametricized. Okay? So we're working with percentages on both surfaces. If you don't, then it's going to go, okay, that's one millimeter, not 100%. Cool? And you can see that I'm starting to see that same curve as points appearing on that surface. And if I just quickly uh, draw an interpolated curve between that, I now have that morphed from that 2D surface to the 3D one. Cool? So just to demonstrate that it works. If we start editing our curve, we start seeing, and if I add, it's getting a bit detailed, but if I add a few more points to the system, then we, we get the re result that we're asking the system to give us. Does that make sense? Good. That works in both directions, okay? So for example, um, if, I wanted to, if I wanted to start drawing uh, some curves on this surface, actually no, let's use the chair. If I want to start drawing curves on this surface, and I want to start my, surf, my curve at this point, but all I've got is that's, that surface as a, as a base, how could I get that point back in, so I can work with it in 2D space? Does, let, me, let me demonstrate. Whoever walks past and sees the chair on the table is just gonna be like, what's going on? <laughs> Okay, so for example, I want to start. I want to start a curve from this point here. Okay, but where does that point exist on that that surface? If I start drawing. Where am I going to get it? Is it going to be exact? And the thing is, accuracy sometimes is very, very important. If I try and draw two lines together and they are actually a millimeter apart, I've got a structural engineer on my ass. Okay? They need to be touching, yeah? So I need to draw a line from exactly that point. How do I do it? And, I, and I'm only allowed to draw it in 2D. I'm going to, I, I, just, I can't even snap, so let's, let's just do it, let's try it. It's going to be wrong. I was totally off, completely off. How do I do it? Anyone? Yeah. Re-elaborate. <laughs> okay, remember this. If I'm able to draw a curve on this table and it will reappear on this bottle, the coordinate, so we're going from 2D to 3D, it, it, can we go the other way? Yes. So would you get the coordinate in that, on that 3D object? Yes. on the 2D surface. Exactly. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So just remember, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be one di directional, okay? This stuff works both ways. This is, this is Einstein type of stuff, guys. Okay? No, I'm, I'm being serious. I'm being serious. 
because we are dealing with curved space in 2D, okay? We're simplifying it, and that's exactly what some of Einstein's concepts were talking about. If you were to take the path of a ball that's thrown and it's curving, and you make that straight, to the ball it's moving straight, but everything else around it is curving, okay? And that's exactly what we're doing here with this. We're just utilizing the maths uh, to, to make that easy for us. So if I were to take that point, and did I bring it in? There it is. If I take that point, I find its relative position on the 3D surface. I get a UV coordinate for that, and I remap that to our 2D surface. And I actually display that. So there's the point, yeah? So if I, if, like, I just quickly bake that just so that <clears throat> if we're just being a bit cheated, cheaty, and I snap to that point, you can see now I've got that curve exactly on that point, yeah? So <clears throat> do you see where I'm going with this? Is this, is it obvious where, if I start talking about tessellating, right? What, where is it easiest to tessellate? On a 2D surface. Right, on a 2D plane, right? And where is it really difficult to work out tessellation? In 3D, right? So what we want to do is we want to start making those tessellations work in 2D, and then we migrate it to 3D, okay? So what, what you'll see is exactly, I, I'm doing exactly this in this stadium uh, roof. So, I know, I know this is probably, this is not, this isn't the scariest script you've ever seen, right? Not quite. Okay. This, this is just a roof. Um, it, might, it might be for you, right, Sophie? Yep, okay. <laughs> um, so you can see here, I've actually taken the edge of the, the roof. That's the edge of the surface. And just, just to demonstrate how the surface is constructed, because that is important, um, it's actually a series of lines like so, so that they, <clears throat> when it lofts, it, it's creating a surface that can be uh, wrapped, unwrapped topologically. If I were to draw, if I would have drawn this like as an XY system, if I then try and uh, create a band, it won't wrap around it, it'll, it'll almost like project over it. Does that make sense? Maybe we'll talk about it in the tutorial. Either way, you can see I've taken the edge, where, where was I? There's the edge of the surface, and I've found where the rakers, so you can see those rakers, I've found where every second one of them is, is intersecting. So if I start, somehow start the diagrid from that point, then it will connect with the raker. Yeah? At that point, we start seeing these components uh, that you'd be quite familiar with from the previous example. So I'm finding the closest point on the surface. That's being mapped to, we're getting the dimensions of that. I'm generating a plane. So, the, uh, sorry, there's our 2D surface. And onto that, I've mapped where those rakers appear on that surface, okay? It's at that point, that's where I, I start making a diagrid. Now, the way I make a diagrid, it might not be the same way you make a diagrid. It really depends on what you need. But in this case, the outcome is something that appears like so. And if I just hide everything, you'll notice that even like because I'm using those points that are uneven on that surface, in a in a even surface, I'm getting a non-even diagrid. Yeah? 
But that's cool. That, that makes complete sense. Yeah? So, that, of course, that would be the case. So, in 2D, there are, we can start doing a lot more things with this. It's very easy to find and actually make cells instead of just lines, like closed polylines in that in 2D. If you would have to do that in 3D, it would take a lot of effort. I can find where these lines ex uh, intersect. If, if I were to draw the, because these are actually straight lines, if I were to draw a straight line from, the, from here to here, uh, it wouldn't touch the surface, right? It would, it would band across it like a drum, yeah? So if I were to then draw a line from here to here, those two lines wouldn't intersect in 3D space. But if you work in UV space, we can find where they intersect. So I can find their intersections and I can break them up and turn them into a single line from that point to that point without having to worry about how that works in 3D. And it's at that point here, you can see that I've, I'm mapping those points onto the onto the 2D surface, working out where their UV coordinate is, and from that I can draw them back onto the 3D surface, and that they, sh they will line up with the rakers, okay? So, realistic application. Lunchbox just does not work in this case, because the, structurally, this thing would fall apart. There'd be bending moments all over the place, right? Is that a question? No, okay. So, in the tutorial, let's make a diagram, okay? I'm not going to do it now, it's going to take too long. Does this, does this make sense? Does anyone have any questions for this particular part? No? No questions? It makes sense? So, you know, the world, it's 3D, we convert it into latitude, longitude, we can then represent it in Google Maps, we can do the same thing with the surface of this chair, with the table, with a bottle, but as long as uh, the surface has how many sides? Four sides, and how many, how many sides can a, to, uh, surfaces? They're always four-sided, right? That's really important to understand. It's probably, uh, you, you guys have been dealing with that subconsciously, and it's only just now that, like hearing it specifically, that you understand what trimming a surface does. It doesn't actually destroy that four-sidedness of it. It still exists, okay? What would you use a W? Ah, so W is in relation to its um, normal. So do you know what a normal is? You were taught what normals were. So um, the normal, best thing, object in here for normals is this, I guess. So a normal is the, the line on a surface that is, all, is perpendicular to everywhere on that surface at that point. So in this case here, the normal would be in that direction, and as we as we move the line down, the normal sticks in the direction like perpendicular to the surface, okay? So all W is, is a distance away from that surface along the normal. So it can be like kind of offset. Yep, so if, if, you, draw, if you draw a sphere yeah. and you go, you go to a point like Mount Everest and you work out its latitude and longitude, right? what its altitude would be is W. And so on that sphere, you could draw a point, and you could say the, the sphere is the average ocean level. Uh, so you could draw a point away from that sphere, and that would be the, the point of Mount Everest on Earth, right? With both its UV, lat long, and altitude, or W. Yeah? yeah. Cool. Does that make sense? Let's let's go.
it's so hot, everyone's like, oh, yeah, yes? Oh, you want me to explain that? I'll explain it. I'll explain it. Yeah. I will. Ex I'll explain it upstairs. Huh? The marks. I uh, put them on your um, wiki. There's lunchbox, and I'm like, it doesn't line up with the structure. That's why I don't like lunchbox. As I said, I very early on, I said I have I have an agenda, and that is I, I want to train you guys up so that you can work with me. Like I'm I'm giving all my secrets away to. Bait smart at the moment, I know that. Pardon? I have a little video camera. Oh, yeah? It's being recorded. Oh, yeah. Thank you. The 5%. Yeah, the exam when we say, hey, do a diagrid without lunchbox. Oh, no, the same thing. Okay. So I'm going to set up another complicated surface that's good enough. Run grasshopper. And we're going to set up that same thing again. So we're going to grab the, the surface or geometry. We're going to measure its uh, dimensions just to create a simple surface. Sure. Um, in this case, I'd prefer to. Uh, I'm not sure. I'd prefer. I'd prefer. Yeah, we we we'll use that. Okay. So, without without even, do you mind locking locking the wheels? Is there a? Can you lock that? Is that? No. Apparently, it was already locked. Ah, uh, can you put my bag in the way? Thank you. So if I if I just quickly draw two lines uh, as a demonstration with these two lines, how what is a way to create just a grid, a standard grid between these two lines? Anyone? Anyone not chewing? <laughs> um, nom, nom, nom. Um, so if I were to just create a standard rectangular grid, I can divide these two curves up and then using that technique that I tested you guys on a few weeks ago, uh, we can flip the matrix and draw polylines between the corresponding points. Okay, then we can just do the exact opposite of that um, so if we divide those polylines up, we can we can end up drawing a grid. Like it's it's drawing a grid without using the grid component, right? So more so if I had a surface that uh, sorry if I had two lines that look like this, then it would it would do the in between grid. Cool. Either way, that's a rectangular grid. We want to do a diagrid, okay? using similar 
a very similar technique. Can anyone think of uh, what the instructions would be for Grasshopper to draw that? So if we've divided our two lines up evenly, how can we start drawing a diagram? Shift the list. Shift the list. Um, and we, we, we shift one list and, and you can draw lines between them. Okay, let's do it. So we're gonna, I'm just going to grab these two as separate lists. I know that's not uh, the best way to do, to do it, but in this case with a diagrid, you usually only have two lines. You never have three. Rare, rarely. It depends. Um, so we're going to shift the list. Is everyone familiar with shifting lists? So um, Romani, Zara, and Sophie, if you were a list, and Romani is the first item in the list, and then Zara is the second, and Sophie is the third, and I shifted it one, then the list would be Zara, Sophie, Romani. So it's just been shifted, and Romani's been gone from the first, and she's been shifted to the last. And if I were to shift it two, the list would go Sophie, Romani, Zara. If I say, do not wrap, so the beginning isn't allowed to go to the end, if I shift it by one, then I'll end up with Zara, Sophie. So there'd be no Romani. And if I shift it by negative one, I would get Romani, Zara. Ne it's shifting in the negative direction. Pardon? Because we, you, can, you can say whether or not to wrap or not. So if you to turn I'll, good, I'll show you the component. And it can only contain three items? No, no, you can have a thousand, right? So shift list, it takes a list, it takes a number that you want to shift it by, and then it, you tell it whether or not you want to wrap. So for example, um, if we were to shift one of these lists by one, by one, and then we draw lines between them, then the, see how this, this one's been shifted to the end of the list and now it's, or, or the start, and it's now going to the, the end. But if I turn the wrap on, or off, sorry, uh, it's, not, it's not shifted, it, it's removed. So that point's no longer used anymore, okay? So in the opposite direction, uh, we, we want to shift both of these, but one of them needs to be shifted negatively. So we're going to set the expression for s to be negative x, and we start to create diagonal lines between our, our two uh, sets of points, okay? But there's a problem. If I start producing that on this surface, so if I, I'm going to take this plane surface, I'm going to uh, explode it into its edges. We're going to grab the, we're going to grab two, uh, the two opposite edges with a dispatch and we're going to, <laughs> Dispatch those and flip one of them because they're, they're going clockwise or counterclockwise and we want them going in the same direction. If I were to use this system now on our surface, so our first curve goes here and our second curve goes there, what's our problem? Pardon? It... Say that again? No, no, that, that is geodesic. If, you, if, we were to, if this was to represent a sphere, a straight line is in its spherical space geodesic. If, if this was a representational of a sphere, then yes, they would be. Because if, so if, if you think, does, is everyone familiar with geodesics? So if I were to, 
if I were to draw a point on Earth, let's say uh, from Sydney to New York, um, a geodesic line is the closest line on the surface of Earth that goes from Sydney to New York. Okay, so it's the line with the shortest distance. You can go in any direction. So you, as long as you as as long as that direction is the shortest, that's geodesic. Now, if you were to take that line, which is a, an arc, and you look at that line in Google Maps, that line would be straight. Okay, so that's what. So if this was a geodesic surface, and we draw and we draw a two D version of it, and we draw straight lines. Uh, so if we draw a spherical surface, then these would be geodesic. Does that does that make sense? No, no. So geodesic always produces the shortest distance on a surface. Doesn't matter what the surface is. Yeah. But they, no, no. We want straight lines, okay? But the okay. Imagine, imagine this is a roof, right? What what are we missing? Ones on the ends. That's what we're missing. Okay. So, uh, what? There's a, there's a few things that we can do. Um, so, what in this case, if we're just going to replicate what uh, Lunchbox does, what we what we want to do is actually extend the lines so that they go beyond the surface. So that way we can draw a diagonal here and here and here. Okay. This isn't exactly what I did. It's similar to what I did with the stadium roof, but it's it's um, it's close to it. Okay, so we are dividing our surfaces by this number. So we let's say we're dividing it by twenty now. Oops. And 20. And if we shift the list, so we're shifting the list 3 and negative 3, how many extra uh, points do we need to generate the full system? 3? Three. Three? Cool. And so in this case, uh, we could either extend the line or duplicate the points um, which way are we going to do it? Shall we extend the line? Let's extend the line. I, I just say extend because I'm doing something else. <laughs> I have no idea what you're doing. Let's extend the line. Okay, so we are taking our curve, we are dividing it by 20. So let's take the length of our curve, uh, divide it by 20 so that we know exactly how long each segment is. Am I that funny? It's okay. Okay, we're dividing our, le our length of our curve by the number that uh, by that number, and then uh, how how much longer do we need it? We need it that number times the number that we're shift we're, we're shifting. So in this case, uh, if we extend uh, this curve by Uh, this division times our shift, so x times y, then we can extend our curve by that much. And we want the, the length to be 0. Oh, OK, we're going the other way. So no, no, I was right. My bad. Sorry. We want both. We want both lengths. So we're shifting by three in both directions. Yeah. And if I increase that to four or five, 
then it just makes those lengths even longer. Yep, cool. But then when we take that line to divide it, we want to, we want to divide it by a few extra segments. So uh, if I want, in this case, if I want six extra segments on the right and six extra segments on the left, and I'm dividing by 20 right now, how many segments do I want overall? It's simple math. If I divide, if I, this length is 20, is divided by 20, and I need six extra on the left and six extra on the right, how many do I need to divide that full length by? Come on, it's so simple. It's very, very simple. How many segments do we want on the left? How many? No, no, we, we've changed it now. It's six now. How many do we want on the left? How many do we want on the right? How many want in the middle? It's 20 right now, yeah. So how many do we need all together? So if we take the full line and we divide it, what number do we want to divide it by? Right, so how do we get 32 from these two numbers? If we consider the count as x and variable y as y, how do we get that? X plus 2y. Brilliant. Cool. So that is, we're going to divide our extended curve by that number. And we are going to extend our second curve and we are going to divide that by that number. And now we're guaranteed that every line that we're generating from that shift will be in that surface. Does that make sense? Kind of. Does that make sense? Sorry, yeah, it's quite... Guys, if you want to move forward, feel free. There's plenty of room. Nope. Okay. So, we've made one direction for our diagrid. What do we need to complete the diagrid? Oh. Look away. Okay, that's better. We've got we've got these guys, right? One, two, three. What do we need to complete it? The other opposite direction. Can someone suggest how we could do that quite simply with what we've got? No, so, so these, see these two lists that have been shifted? One of them has been shifted in the positive direction and the other one has been shifted in the negative direction and that's created, let's say, a left-hand slope, yeah? So what could we do to make a right-hand slope? Yep. I, I, you guys will eventually get used to me asking you the simplest of simplest questions. If I don't, if I think you don't un, don't understand it, I'll explain it. And if I think you understand it, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you have to copy everything? What do you mean? Well, that's I just copied it because it's faster. I don't understand what you're saying. No, no, please, please. No, when I say that, can you elaborate? No, I just figured it out. Okay, you figured it out. Okay, good. Yeah, it's fortunately with this system, it's okay. We're never going to have more than two. Like you can never have a 
a second set of sides for your surface. Like if we were making a diag, we could make a diagram a different way by taking squares and dividing, like crossing them, making crosses. But we're, in this case, we're, we're doing it this way. So we've, we've got lines, but the, the annoying thing is they now go beyond our surface. Can I move what to the left? Sure. So they, they move beyond the surface. So what, what, what do we need to do? We need to get rid of those, the, the extension lines, okay? So do you mind writing sudas? Thank you. Um, so is any, everyone familiar with some of the functions that do, do that? Yes or no? No? Okay, so in intersect, there are these region-based uh, splitting functions. And the one that we would like to use is trim with a region. Uh, an uh, annoying semantic element of Grasshopper is sometimes they change their names up. So for example, uh, when we do an evaluate surface, Uh, the out the output of the you can get a point a normal or a frame so some components refer to planes as frames annoying I wish it just called it planes right and the same applies here so a region is also another way of saying a closed curve a planar closed curve okay so we can trim with a planar closed curve. We've got one of those, and that's the actual outline of our surface. So the outline of our surface goes into the region, and the curves that we're generating go into the, the curve. And if I just hide that and we look at the outcome of that, that gives us the inside curves that are trimmed by that region, and then it also gives us the outside curves. And in this case, we want to keep the, the inside curves. Cool? So we can apply that same thing to our second set. Keep going. Pardon? I, what I did was I got this, the plane surface. I used the curve parameter, which actually what it does is if you've got a surface, it just gives you the boundary of that surface, which is a little trick. And then uh, we use that in the trim region, and yeah, we want the, the inside. But can you just break the other line and just add it to the seam? Yeah, you could do this. Okay. You could do that, but um, sometimes it matters, like it matters to keep the, the left hand away from the right hand, sometimes. Um, in this case, we'll, we'll say no, we'll, we'll join them, but I will, I will give you an example of why you want it to be this case. Yeah, I'll, that we'll, keep, we'll do exactly what you, this particular way, but I'll, I'll demonstrate why it's not perfect, okay? So we've now got our curves, we're going to divide them up. by a reasonable number. We're going to find where those points exist on our uh, planar surface. So we're going to use curve closest, uh, surface closest point. So our base surface goes into that and our points go in and we want to test it at a reparameterized uh, scale, so we want percentages, not dimensions, and then we want to evaluate our original surf 3D surface. So there it is. There, this this is a re repeat of a lot of the stuff that I did in the lecture. So our final our 3D surface gets reparameterized. We uh, put our UVs in. 
then if I just hide everything and create an uh, interpolated line from those points, I should get a nice diagrid spread across that surface. Cool. I understand this is complicated, but understanding the UV, that the UV to XYZ and back again, that's quite an important thing to understand, okay? So the, the key thing here is, now that you know, like you have complete control over the system, you don't have to rely on, like this is doing exactly what Lunchbox does, but one really important thing, if I throw Lunchbox into this right now, Um, you'll notice they're, they're not exactly lining up. Now, lunch, lunchbox are the lines in green. Can anyone, does anyone have an idea of why they don't line up? Correct. And what lines did we draw? Yeah, so we've drawn curves that follow the surface, whilst Lunchbox has drawn lines that are straight, okay? Now, there, I'm not saying that either of those two are the right thing, but when you go out and you uh, create a roof and you give the builders and engineers center lines for the steel work, let's say these lines are steel, and they go and actually start manufacturing this thing, usually the cheapest, what, what type of line, what type of curve is, do you think is the cheapest that a steel maker can manufacture? Straight. And then the second cheapest? There's, there's gonna be three. So the, the most expensive is the one that we're looking at right now which is curved, what do you think is the second cheapest? Bent. Huh? Bent. No, no, okay, ignore, it's just a single one, it's not, like bending it is putting a curve into it, but the bend, what type of geometry is the bend, could the bend be? Multiple straight lines? No, it, ha it is an arc, right? So. Straight lines are really cheap. Arcs, like segments of circles, they are the, they're more expensive. And then the most expensive is variable curvature. Like, so basically, when people, when they make a rolled steel element, they put it in a machine that like it, you know when you run scissors along a ribbon and it makes it curl up? It does that, right? So it does it as a uniform, at a uniform speed with a uniform strength and it creates an arc. If you want it to create a weird spline, it has to do that at a variable speed, at a variable strength, and it's really complicated, right? So yes, in the case of if you were making this out of steel, you would most certainly want uh, our lines to be straight. But if we were making this out of sheet material, like, uh, PTFE, which is like a plastic that we use to make stadium roofs, they're not going to be straight, they're going to be curved, right? Because that's fabric can curve, and if anything, uh, as a lot of uh, fabric structures prove, if they're not curved, then that doesn't have sh uh, structural strength to it. So, Lunchbox 
in this case would be incapable of giving us those curved lines because it's designed to give you the straight ones. So this is why it's good to know how to do this yourself. Now, what if we want to make our own straight line version? And this is where, um, I've, where you need to start keeping those two systems ap apart, the left and right handed slope. So we'll do that. We want to keep left and right apart. Are you good, Nick? OK, good. We're keeping them apart. We're going to trim them with the region. But we now need to start working on a system that will eventually draw a straight line between this intersection and this intersection. OK? So to do that, we need to start splitting these lines up. Because if you split them up, then you know exactly where the points are on, on your surface, and then you can draw polylines between them. So let's do that. Our left-handed lines, need to, we need to find the intersection with the right-handed lines. And with that, we have a curve by curve with curve intersection. And if we would just plug them straight in, we get a single intersection. Now, if you think back to this lecture, remember this lecture? Does anyone, anyone know why we would only get one series of intersections and not all, every intersection? Just think back to, pardon? The data structure. Do you remember? Do you remember that? If you have a list of that's three long and a list that's too long, which th which element reacts with which element? So in this case, just just have a look at the data. We've got a branch with a line in it, and we've got another branch with a line in it. Only those two branches are going to intersect. It's only going to find the intersection of both those branches. OK? Quick and easy solution. I know I'm getting blank stairs. Quick and easy solution, just flatten one of the lists. So in this case, we're going to flatten the B, list B. We get every point. <laughs> OK? I'm getting blank stairs, but that's OK. OK, cool. Critical thing here is, because our original, the A list is um, grafted still, if we simplify this and then trim it, we should get a list of points that make up that line. So for example, if this line here was this one, we're getting one, two, three points. Yeah? Is it easy to read? Okay. And then the second line, we're getting five points. We're getting one, two, three, four, five. Cool? So that's now in a data structure that if I were to plug that into, let's get rid of lunchbox. If I were to plug that into this system now, instead of using a interpolate, if I were to use a polyline, we can see, uh, sorry, I've got big planes. We can see our evaluate is giving the points in the, in the diagrid system but they're now structured in those left-handed bands. So now if I, if I were to look at the polyline that's created between them, there's, it's a polyline that goes from point to point, so therefore we should get a straight line between each point. Cool? And to do the opposite, we just have to, instead of flattening B, flatten A, and that should give us the, the lines in the opposite direction. Cool. Is this is this too complex? Uh, yes. Is it complex for everyone else? Yes. It's too complex. Pardon? I'm going too fast. Okay. Does this? Do I need to explain this? 
This, okay. <laughs> what is that? Okay, I have to explain it. Yep, so what it is, is it, you, you find it in the uh, intersection tab and you'll find it under physical. And so with that, it's a physical curve and curve intersection. So uh, in the intersection tab, there are really two different types of intersections, like when you look at geometries. There's mathematical and there's physical. Mathematical means anything that uses uh, an object that could be explained simply with maths. So for example, uh, my, if you imagine my finger as a line, right, it's only a finger's length, right? But mathematically, a line can go for infinity in both directions. So I could, without actually having to extend the line to 100 meters, work out where it intersects with the building across the quadrangle just by using simple maths, right? But if I were to use a physical intersection between my finger and the building over there, I would physically have to go over there and put my finger through it to work out where it intersects, okay? So you'll see here, we're in the mathematical uh, intersections, at least one component in those intersections is something that can be infinite, be it a line in this first section, so line, 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 and ray, yet ray is just a line, or planes, so planes, all of these are planes, and then you've got isovists, they're just lines, okay? So lines and planes, they're the only things that can be mathematical intersections. Mind you, you can intersect them with anything. And then there's physical. So what that's doing is it's taking two curves. And it's finding their physical intersections. <coughs> so where do these two, two, two curves intersect? At that point. Right? Make sense? Okay. Pardon? It outputs the point. It also outputs the percentage or the dimension along each of the curves at which, at the point at which it does intersect. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the sub. Huh? So yeah, if it's like right now, if that's point, if this line is A, then let's say that's 10% 10, 10 along, the output would be, if we reparameterize A, the output would be 0.1. And we'll see what A is actually giving us. Ah, okay. A is the second one. So we're getting 0.16, right? So that's, that's just the percentage along the line that it's being intersected, okay? But the thing is, if I have two lines, uh, sorry, four lines, and we use, we have a list of two and a list of two, then the way Grasshopper works, if you've got two lists of equal length, what, I, what item from uh, the first, the first item from the first list interacts with which item in the second? Right, and the second item in the first list it operates on the second, right? So you can see here, if this is the first item of the first list, and that's the second item of the second, that's giving us that intersection point, yeah? That's why we're not getting this one, because that's the first item, and that's the second. So item two and item two interact, and item one and item one interact, or zero, zero, and one, one, okay? So that's why we've needed to uh, flatten and graft these these because once we do that if I were to graft one of these as they come in it's now taking this line and finding the intersection with every other line so these two and then it's taking this line and it's finding every intersection with every other line which would be these two giving us every intersection does that make sense is that what you needed clarified Okay, so that's what we're doing here. Now the, the key thing is, depending on which one you graft, 
is going to determine the data structure of the points as they come out. So if you graphed line A, then the points are going to come out of line A, uh, sorry, they're going to come out relative to line A and the, the A system. And if you graphed, if you grafted B, then they would come out in the B structure. And so the, what's the opposite of grafting? Right, and so our data's already grafted, so we want to do the opposite, and so that's why we're flattening B and flattening A. Okay? Okay. Trim tree, I haven't really explained that, but, and I, I think we might explain it after the break. No, I, I explained simplify. What, did I explain trim tree? That's simplified. Okay, trim does a little bit different stuff. I'll, I'll explain it after the break. But at the end of it, it all it creates our um, <coughs> our lines. Okay. I understand that this might not be specifically uh, relative to your design, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a diagrid. I can draw any type of grid over this system, you just have to be, you just have to consider what, how to draw those grids, okay? So, in this case we've drawn a diagrid there, but if I were to draw a hexagonal grid with this script, I'm not gonna, it's not gonna cover the whole surface, but that's fine. Um, and I'm just gonna steal this guy. I can draw a hexagonal grid, I'll flatten that. It's not something that you necessarily need to follow along too much, it's just more an example. But that will allow us to uh, move the, that hexagonal grid onto our 3D surface, okay? So if you can draw it in 2D, you can draw it on a 3D surface. And I think, I think that is something that each of you may have relative to your design. Especially everyone here has got surfaces. It, I'm pretty, I'm pretty certain everyone's got a surface. So at what point could you start doing some layout, like laying out details in 2D to then migrate that onto your 3D surface? Like I, I can actually see most of your designs in my head and see how it could relate. Definitely, 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 definitely. Yes. Just, just imagine, you me remember how you created your um, complicated mesh structure? You could have done it this way. Think about it. Definitely, de like, right? So it's, it's important. I use it a lot. Understanding how to move something from a 3D surface to a 2D space and back is very useful. I can't believe how useful it is. I can't believe. It, I, I can't stress how much, how useful it is to you guys without sort of saying that it's like, it's saved my job in the past. Like I could, probably would have lost my job if I didn't understand this. Would you, would you agree? Absolutely. Yes. Would, are you actually, <laughs> as in, as in, there are, there are, there are things that we, we get asked to do and if we didn't understand this, we couldn't do it, right? It's so important. Well, I've never lost my job, so probably I understand Yeah, yeah, it. you understand it. I, I would, I, I'm just, 
I'm pretty sure I'd be in big trouble if I f fucked up some of the jobs. What is that? Uh, just... I was reading one of their, their assignments. Huh? I'm, I'm reading one of their assignments. Um, it's, so it's, the, it's migrating 3D surface information to 2D and 2D surface information back, back to 3D. 3D. It's so important, um, especially if you start getting into, like as computational designers, the f one of the first things that are gonna be required of you is to panelize uh, two degree surfaces. And so with that, you, you need to start using these types of techniques. Can you give them in the last three panels? These, these three? Yep. <coughs> um, it's being recorded. It'll be on YouTube eventually. Um, now, there's one more thing that James has asked me to clarify, and I'll just do a little demonstration. And this, this is actually relative to a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today. Um, let's close that one. So, If, if I were to be living, if I was living in uh, Iceland and I wanted to uh, map my house, <laughs> pardon? This is cool. I really like this. How do I delete it? I don't want US, I don't want India, I don't want... Okay, let's use Greenland as an example. Iceland's a bit small. Let's use Greenland. So there's Greenland. Greenland's huge. It's got this tumorous big fat area above it. It's, ma it's absolutely massive, right? And so if I was living, if I was insane and I was living up here somewhere, because I've not very many people live up there, right? Yeah, okay, good, I'm right. Not insane. If I was um, an Inuit um, or someone like that living up, up in this region and I, for some reason, wanted to map my house out, I get, go get a survey and I draw it up and I measure the dimension in, uh, on the survey and it comes out to be 100 metres. But in fact, in reality, it's only 2 metres because the, the way that we've unwrapped the earth for that survey has stretched that out to 200 meters. So for example, if we were to take Greenland and actually migrate that to the equator, that's, the, that's like a relative size of Greenland to Australia, right? So you can see Greenland there, it's huge. And then down here, it's tiny, right? Or Australia. There's Australia, we move that up to Greenland. Whoa, right? Like that's Australia's relative size on using this particular unwrapped environment, okay? So, and the, re the reason I'm talking about this is that some of you are uh, having issues with your uh, models, they're they're getting a bit funky as you get far, like as you deal with it, like meshes don't look good and they flick around and, and stuff like that. And that this, this is actually an important reason why. So in Greenland, do you think they use, in, what we're seeing here is Web Mercator. Do you think they use Web Mercator to unwrap the earth? So if, that, if you were to look at a map of Greenland, so you take Greenland and you flatten it, similar to what we just did. Do you think they would use uh, this system to create maps of Greenland? Maps 
it might, this is good for looking at like where Greenland is relative to Australia, but let's say I'm, I'm in here, like I'm designing a little house in here, and for every metre that I draw, it's actually only half a metre. Do you think they use this, this mapping system to, to draw their country? No, right? Do you, think, do you think people in Sydney use this system to draw Australia? No. So there are different ways of, there are different ways of unwrapping the earth and this guy has actually done a really cool example of what they are. Um, and if I can find them. Yes. So these are different map projections. Um, and what they do is they, they're, they're just different mathematical ways of unwrapping uh, the world. So let's find a really interesting one. Oh, that's cool. So this particular one uh, turns the, the Earth into two, should I zoom in? Turn into two sort of circles. And I believe as you get to the center of it, it's, it's got the least amount of distortion, okay? So every country has decided that they're gonna use a different type of uh, unwrapping system, and there's a whole bunch of them, um, for their particular, for their surveying, okay? So in New South Wales, we have three normally, and they're called MGA 54, 55, and 56. Feel free to write this down. It's worth writing down. What are you saying then? Pardon? What are you saying? Uh, the, it is recorded on YouTube. It is. <laughs> no, but it, it's worth writing this one down. Um, so the three the three coordinate systems that we regularly use are MGA 54, 55, and 56. I can't remember which one uh, is, oh no, no, the most common one is 56. That's the most common in Sydney. And so um, if I were to, let's go to um, UNSW. There you are. Pardon? Google Map uses a system called Web Mercator. Did you say it was like MGA? MGA. M for Mary. Where's the red center? Is this the red? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're here. Um, this is called Six Maps. Um, it's New South Wales, like, it's a really cool mapping system for New South Wales. Um, I'm going to go grab the coordinate of where I think we are relatively. I think we're somewhere around here. And we're getting a latitude of minus 33, longitude of 151. But if I go to MGA 56, we can see that is 30, 30, 336,000 meters east and 6,245,536 meters north, right? So somewhere there's a center point, right? So that center point is, uh, it might, if we can actually go to it, I think. It's so far away that it's not even in New South Wales. I'm going to have to restart. So what that means is that it's kind of like if we were to go to this, this guy, so somewhere in here is the center point. So if we go take Australia, some, somewhere is the center point of that map. And then I wish this would stop moving. And then three six million uh, meters north and 300,000 meters east is where New South Wales is relative to that, okay? So that means that 
the center point is there in your model, but the survey is going to give you something that is, if this is in meters, uh, six million, it's more than six million, six billion in millimeters. Uh, six billion millimeters away uh, to the north and I think it is 30 million uh, millimeters to the east. I think I have to put another zero on that. Whatever. Okay. So it's really far away. And the thing is, this is an agreed coordinate that all surveyors have to use in New South Wales. So that means any survey that you get from them has to be to that coordinate system. Okay. So this is where uh, the sort of computational side of things comes into play. Every number in a computer is limited to the amount of digits it has. Okay. So I forget how many digits is actually the limit, but you can't have a number with 100 numbers in it. It can only, let's say it can only have 64 numbers in it. Yeah? So as we move further and further and further away from our origin, everything is being related back to that origin. So even though you're drawing a meter long line, that meter long line has a coordinate that is six billion millimeters away from the origin and it has another coordinate that's six billion meters away from the origin okay so as you do that things start to get truncated off that number so for example if i were to draw a sphere here i really hope this this i'm far enough away please be far enough away Uh, so you can you can already see this is taking it's actually having a really hard time displaying it. It's taking longer to display because it's having to deal with really large numbers. If I start to mesh this, ah, oh, damn it, still not far enough. It should, we, we'll, it'll actually start truncating the numbers off. So the coordinates of this mesh are so that there's so many numbers in them. Uh, it's actually it's actually doing reasonably well. There's so many numbers that it's 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 problematic. I just rub that in. It's problematic. It's hard to sort of demonstrate. So what that means is, when I gave you the survey, a lot of you are still working in the exact coordinate of where that, that survey was drawn, right? Which means that you're working six billion meters away, six million meters away from the origin of your model, okay? So the computer's doing, uh, it's, it's having to deal with more digits than it normally has to, and it might even start removing digits from your number just to make it run better. It might have to do it just to even run, okay? So you could be, the further you go, you might even get to a point where you can't even be one millimeter accurate, it will only be 10 millimeters accurate, or it might even be 100 millimeters accurate, okay? So a really good thing to do whenever you start a file is to pick a point in in your uh, survey 
So we'll just pick this one. Uh, we'll find out the coordinate of that. So to do that, we're going to go, we're going to use a vector, we're going to convert points to numbers. And then we're going to join these numbers with a comma. Why is it not, ah, oh, sorry, it's split. Join, I want join. Join these numbers with a comma. I'm gonna copy that, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a text object on that point. We're gonna give, give it the actual coordinate so that we never forget. There it is. Let's just make that a bit bigger. Okay, whatever I made was massive. Okay, so there's our number, and that's got a point attached to it as well. And the best thing to do is basically select everything in your model and move that point to zero. Now, in the future, you know exactly where that point is. I've lost everything. You know exactly where that point is in relative space back, back to this sort of system. So we know where that is in a... Uh, whoop. So if we get more information from a surveyor or we need to give information relative to the survey, we can move it back. But it means that as we work, we're working at a very short distance away from our origin and the computer will run faster and you will have meshes that don't fuck up and everything should be better. Just life should be better. Okay? So uh, do that. Please do that. That's worth doing now on your assignment. I'm sorry I didn't bring it up before. Usually I wait for people to complain and James is the first person to complain. So. <coughs> Yep, it's the, it's the same, like if you're working in Revit, they call it shared coordinate. Um, the, what's really interesting in Revit is if, if you go like a kilometer, even a kilometer away, it goes nah. So, yeah. Uh, it's also worth noting that if you work in meters on a, you, like you should be working in meters on a big, big, big job. You should be working in kilometers in, a, in an urban planning job, like, just consider that the instant you start changing the uh, unit that you work in, it can help your system run better. And there's, a, there's an art to choosing. So I, I usually work in stadiums, I like to work in meters, but there are other people who like to work in millimeters. I've, I, work, I work in meters a lot in, with stadiums, but the thing is if I... If, you work in millimeters. I work in meters when I have to do um, planning, urban design, yeah. uh, landscape design, but millimeters when it's about <coughs> Yep. The, the interesting thing is you can have two files integrate with each other as long as they know, as long as one file is defined as millimeters and the other is defined as meters, they should work together perfectly. Mm -hmm. So that's I, th that's why I work in meters because like but it's a hundred meters long. Um, like uh, solar analysis and uh, ladybug. Yes. So, so in um, so architects, our main uh, dimension is millimeters, but engineers prefer meters. And Be industrial design or interior design centimeters. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird. So um, all the all the engineering units, like Pascal's, um, they're in uh, Newton meters. It's, so it's pressure over a square meter. It's not pressure over a square millimeter. So usually because all their units 
uh, are being defined by newtons or kilonewtons over a meter unit, they usually work in meters. Otherwise, it's annoying to convert to meters and then get your pascals and then com convert back. It's just... What type of engineer? Structural engineer? And they don't work in meters? Their calculations are in meters. And that, that's, so they, when they model on the computer, they usually use meters. Uh, Corumba, for example, is a structural analysis tool. And it wants, for some reason, it wants everything in meters uh, in terms of its uh, dimensions uh, for like lengths and whatnot. But then the dimensions of, a, of the actual steel that you put in has to be in centimeters. Like, just shoot me in the head, it's annoying. But at least we're not working with feet and inches. So just, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so origins, very important. Go define one. Um, I, mapping between 2D and 3D, important. Try and get your head around it. Try and use it on your designs. Marking should be done as soon, hopefully by the weekend. Um, I will email you your mucks. Um, we've got an hour and a half left of this tutorial. Does anyone want me to cover anything, answer any questions, or do you just want to discuss privately your designs? With Julia and I. No, okay. Eden doesn't want to do anything. Just doesn't care, don't mind, whatever. Cool. Did, what did, what did um, Michael say? Okay. Cool. Yeah, now that I've got those, now that I've got